to that. Talking about, you know, ending plastic production, and Renee and I have spoken about this, and Susan have spoken about this in various ways as well, but maybe not necessarily in the ways of its connection to ending in a sequence of data order, I suppose, slaughterhouses, and why those two material things, the two out of the six line items of things that we're going to end, is really a invitation to end this energy that has been around for centuries and centuries, and it's not sustainable. And I feel like women bodied human beings and individuals who are more, you know, feminine leaning, have access to that consciousness and because they have access to that consciousness they can see things and they can like envision aspects of our new world more than people who are like no this is how it is and you have to still pay your taxes and la 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 right like we're really seeing a huge shift now where women are really stepping up and like saying no you know starting with Susan's aunt who she was you know was like talking like like like, like these seeds are like now like coming coming out I suppose bearing fruit well, and think about it. That was a food producer saying no. Right. She's, she was a miller. She ground grain for a living. And she was not going to have people tell her what time it was. Yeah. It was a really interesting dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. So sweet. All right. I, I emailed the last participant that signed up. So we'll see if he's going to log on. But Renee, I'm going to send everyone a link to because when people I forget about this thing about zoom when people sign up later and when stuff has been shared on the chat people don't get all this stuff on the chat so oh. gonna, that's okay I, I'll resend it again so earth hero has decided to partner with us and they've graciously given us a wonderful discount code that I would highly recommend you guys check out their stuff and specifically 25% off one item they're having a birthday sale that's going on this week this month, I believe, is their birthday month, but they're great. They are a sustainable business that really, I feel like the fact that, okay, so Earth Hero, out of all the companies that we reached out to, were the only ones that said yes to partnering with us. And given our social media presence and our presence online in general, a lot of these other companies did not want to partner with us. But Earth Hero, according to Kyle, is the Amazon of sustainable products. And I'm talking about this as a recorded thing because it has been testament to the energy that I've been devoted to these last five years about growing a business in a way that makes no to little sense to anybody else. Yet we're still able to partner with industries that hold that sort of social capital, you know, in that way. And I feel like it's because our roots come from the same place. We're coming from the same place. We're not trying to expand in a way that's all about growth and trying to get our Instagram numbers up and playing this game still, you know, we're, we're committed to doing the work, you know, and a lot of times it doesn't make sense to the outside world, but we can't let that sort of shift us away from, from what it is that we're following and what's calling us. So that's what I would like to share with you guys. Yeah, uh, I wonder. One of my what? Sorry, Susan, sorry. <laughs> No, I just wondered what that was. So thank you for explaining. Yeah, 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 yeah. Renee, what were you going to say? Oh, no, no, that was nothing. I was just saying that I saw them on Instagram. It's, yeah, it seems like a really cool company. Yeah, they have really cute products too. <laughs> they're like a wholesaler. Yeah, and they're also a member of 1% for the planet. Because um, mm -hmm. my company is also a member. So I, I like, you know, this knowing about other companies that are members. So thanks. Yeah, absolutely. All right, ladies. The first intro question for today's session, and again, call to say thank you again for taking the time out to join us. Renee, I apologize that you weren't able to join us last Friday. That was nonsense. I was no worries. in the middle of Virginia with, with literally turned, I turned into a place called Battlefield. Oh, that was, yeah. <laughs> Right. It was in um, just Virginia or West Virginia? Virginia. Okay. Yeah, starting through. Yeah, I've, I've been around that area because I used to live in Maryland. So mm -hmm. like the DMV area, it's just in this one little yep. circle. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Our first question is, if you could wave a magic wand 
and change one thing about our current climate crisis, what would it be? Mm. Well, for me, um, I know that we're there's so many things to tackle, you know, like um, plastic pollution waste and, uh, um, but I think, you know, just looking at what is making the biggest um, or contributing to, to, to the problem the most, I think those are the areas that I feel like I wish would get more attention. So for example, the ones that, you know, have the biggest carbon footprint. Um, I know that, well, I was actually really happy when I learned last night that they, pa that they passed this bill, you know, um, you know, in terms of, uh, um, you know, that, that would actually give, you know, money to climate, um, you know, like, for example, buying um, energy efficient appliances, um, EV cars, you know, rather than it be a state by state situation, because I, I know when I went to California, a lot of people were driving, you know, you know, EV cars. But the thing is, I, I'm just really happy that they were um, allowing for, you know, not just, a, you know, an upper middle class person. It's, it shouldn't be a situation where only um, people over a certain income level should be able to afford um, an electric car. I think it should be um, affordable to everyone. So I think just tackling um, this, you know, this carbon situation in terms of looking at EV cars, electrifying everything. Um, and that's where I would love to, uh, the direction that I think we should go, electrifying everything. Um, you know, giving people to put solar panels on their houses if they have a home, you know? And uh, if they want to invest in certain appliances that will, uh, um, you know, is more energy efficient. And so pretty much just having less dependence on fossil fuels. I think that's the direction, that's where I, I would like to see us making the biggest impact where we're less dependent on that industry and electrifying everything. My conspiracy mind heard a couple of astrologers talk about, you know, Elon's ploy to electrify cars as a way to control because once we electrify cars and there's also a lot of backlash on the lithium batteries that get have to be produced so it's like yeah there's 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 a high there's like a lot of criticism about electric cars and what it's actually doing and then i heard something about where the electricity is actually coming from it's still coming from fossil fuels which blew my mind it completely like the whole point right of something to do this and then the very core of where it's actually coming from is still the same problem you know what I mean? It's like in the same zone of like biodegradable plastic. <laughs> right. And, and batteries for electric cars are only good for 10 years and then they drop them in the ravines here. We're becoming a massive dump of lithium batteries very quickly on this island because yeah. nothing ever leaves an island ever. Unless but was that really what? his vision though, Hanel? Because from what I understand is that he wanted to like power the highways where you will drive and it it, auto, it charges your car. So the vision was that we would um, be less reliant on, you know, people, you know, charging a car at home and using, of course, the fossil fuel electricity and instead, um, you know, electrify the highways, electrify um, pretty much everything so that the cars are not dependent on fossil fuel, or sorry, the EV cars are not dependent on fossil fuels. But I know that he's certainly not where he wants to be in terms of that vision. Or, you know, I know that some of these projects that they had, um, Tesla had said, you know, well, because I actually read the book and, you know, they're talking about all of these things, but I know they haven't come to fruition. But I definitely get what you're saying. But, you know, I, I definitely believe that if I had that art, where, had that vision come to fruition, it certainly will um, help with the cause. But I'm just really hoping that they carry through with that. Yeah. No, that wasn't what my thought of his vision. That was an astrologer. It was like talking about government control. And when we have, you know, 
oh, I don't know, when they can control our GPS, for instance, right? And then they can control our cars. And someone was saying that they might, like, what if everything's electrified? They can turn it off whenever they want. It was still connected to the grid, you know? That's, that's where my conspiracy theories, I don't trust the government, full stop, full stop, full stop, comes from. So that's where I'm like, I 100% if we can move away from fossil fuels, that's, that's right, like, it's like one little... Speaking of jellyfish making, that's like one little like tentacle from the grand scheme of things. Yeah. I think yeah. If, I, if I were going to wave a magic wand, I'd go for something more systemic, like magically all oil and gas turns into fresh, clean water. Yeah. Because we're, we can be very lazy as a species. And unless oil is removed from the equation, we will never move on to higher plane energy dynamics. You know, we, we need a bigger push than what we've ever seen. Like COVID is just peanuts and nuclear war is peanuts. We need to just completely erase something that we're dependent on for us to learn to walk without it. So, but it would be rugged. I'm, I'm not, I think I want to be dead before that happens because I'm not going Thank to get with the tracks. <laughs> Leave us with that. <laughs> but, you know, the, to really wave a magic wand, it's going to be way beyond disruption as we understand it. Um, but if it was all clean water, it would solve a different problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so big, it's so much. My answer would be to shift the consciousness of the leaders of the people in the same direction so that all of us are on board about shifting paradigms out of matrix-led behavioral patterns that we and personalities that we've picked up along the way. Yeah, especially especially now when conflict is, especially today for some reason. Yeah, I was like, even now the sirens are out. So yeah, I would definitely move consciousness. Like you know, go to sleep for twenty four hours and then wake up, and then we're all we're all on the same page. You know, we're all on the same page. Like yeah, we're gonna end the wars, guys. You know, come back. You know, Palestine, Israel, shake hands. We're throwing a birthday party for you guys. Like everything's okay. You know what I mean. <laughs> bring on the cake <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and you guys I really do feel like that's the direction that we're headed to I really really feel it inside I feel it like I feel it I feel it inside my body and it's like I can't look away from it. And, and and I feel really bad sometimes when I when I'm unable to like express or like communicate the vision to people which is why I feel like I've been on this like five-year like stuff about like communicating on different ways as possible because it really is really 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 beautiful and it's really it's it's like nothing if, if you guys are on TikTok I follow a bunch of card readers and tarot readers it's just like magical gypsy land and everything's like really colorful and we're already seeing little snippets of that but the matrix has also sort of like taken that over right like taken the rainbow over and like sort of like put that on certain things but outside of that like they cannot replicate that energy that I'm speaking about. So I'm really grateful that I'm at least tapped into that so that my work is coming from that place and knowing that it's not from that place. And yeah, but it's beautiful, you guys. And it smells really good and it's super clean. A lot of things are free. Billboards aren't a thing. The news isn't a thing. The news is literally decomposing as we speak. This is like their final like latch. It's, it's a business. They have to sort of report on things like you know, bad things sort of have to happen in the world so they, they can keep their jobs. They thrive on drama. You know, <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. Okay, so cool. Thanks for sharing that. All right, so next question. What comes up as a first line item when you hear end plastic production? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure, yep, yep, yep. What comes up as a first line item when you hear and plastic production. I'm gonna put that question in the box. Good, we need to have these questions for later too, because they're good things to think about when you're working with stuff. 
Um, yeah, I think I'll stick with all oil turning into water because it is the source of plastic. It started as a byproduct and now it's probably even more powerful financially than selling crude oil because it's infiltrated all parts of our life even more than power supply has. So if, oil in what's that process looking like Susan um well I mean people are going to drill for oil as long as there's oil to drill for so we need to burn it all up and make it go away and because without oil you can't have plastic so it it has to start at the source if you don't turn out off the source yeah. it's going to keep coming is that oil being used in a positive way at all well i think there are people who would say yes like in the medical technologies where you need absolute sterile situations and plastics can give you that um, but i'll tell you personally having worked at the transfer stations here that medical waste is now one of our biggest growing uh, trash pile problems in our landfill. So it's got a positive benefit saving people's lives in the short term, but in the long term, it's with us for thousands of years. So um, I think overall, uh, plastic is much more problematic than metal or glass as far as something that humans make. And I also feel like we have enough plastic in the world right now. We don't need to make more. Like, that's like where I'm coming from. It's like we have so much that we can possibly find and figure out a way to manufacture the pieces that already exist and turn them into the products that we need, even in the medical field. Uh, that's what we're trying to do at Volcano Precious Plastics, but we're doing it out of our own self-funding and we're finding it, it's incredibly hard right now. There's no infrastructure really available to support our activity. And ours is just one tiny piece. Our first line item that we went after was collecting two kinds of plastic and making sure it was 100% lab clean so we could make it into products mm. as opposed to fighting the rats and the cockroaches and the mold. Um, and we have 40 families that have been contributing to this process, but the other ends of the process, like the thing to make the plastic with, we don't have that part. People to use the plastic once we've made it, we don't have that part. We're working on it. It's a two year process so far. And we've just started to make headway oddly in making weed whacker line. Wow. Which weed whacker line is plastic, it's not rope. So you end up with all these little bits of weed whacker line everywhere. So in a way we're contributing to distributing plastic through the environment, but at least people aren't buying giant spools. Right from the mainland, we're actually making those, we hope to make those spools right here. Right. What I would like is to convert it to uh, plant-based material eventually, but that's me. I'm a rope maker as part of my lay making practice. I know how to do that. Most people don't know how to do that. Right, right. You taught me how to make that one time. Yeah. And now I know how to make rope out of hollow, which is fishing line. That's really amazing stuff. Yeah takes forever though. I mean, if you make a net out of it, it's going to take you a year. Jeez. Yes. And I know a man who does it. <laughs> One net a year, a big net, but yeah, takes wow. a long time. Susan, we need to replicate like 15 Susans and all, all over the world and teach people how to make these things. And we'd all be exhausted. <laughs> But I feel like that, that very act of like creating something that takes that long really is the antithesis of like capitalism, you know, take a year sure. to make your net, you know, like, you know what well, I mean? It's the indigenous practice here. And a lot of the folks who do it have moved on to using fishing line, which is sad, it's plastic, um, but it cuts their making time in half. Yeah. But the rule here was your net maker always has fish. The net maker does not fish. You, the net maker gives the fish to the fishing family and he gets fish for a lifetime, he or she, out of that deal. So it's Gosh. a reciprocal relationship. Yep, 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 um, yep. You, 
you feed those people who take a year to make that thing. So, and it's very, I mean, when the kapu system, the rule system, kapu does not mean forbidden, it means rule. Um, when the rule system was broken, a lot of those exchanges were broken at the same time. How do you spell that, Susan? Kapu? K-A-P-U. You know it in English as taboo. Okay. It's the same word. Uh, but the Kapu system was not forbidden. It was the rule-based system by which the Hawaiian people lived. But the part that, the sensational part that got to Western mind was the, you know, you do something forbidden and you end up being executed. Uh, because the Kapu system was very severe. It's the only way 500,000 people could live on this island um, was to follow a very strict rule system about how you maintain the land and then it maintains you. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So rule breakers, mm, they, they, they didn't have a prison. It was pretty, pretty harsh, but it worked. Mm. Yikes, yeah. Just sharing that you guys. I would like to maybe shift it over now to the section where Susan teaches us how to make jellyfish. All right. So I simplify, I put out a list that Hannah found rather daunting because it was everything and the kitchen sink. But my first favorite object to make jellyfish out of is plastic bottles. And if you have a big one, that's great. You can use little ones. This scales up or down really well. I've used um, plastic colanders like you find all over Singapore in people's, um, you can use all kinds of things. Uh, another favorite is the top of ye old Starbucks yep. big container, little jelly cups, things like that. This bottle I cut in half in my preferred way. And I'll show you here, here's a victim. It's smaller, but same idea. I usually take the label off because I think labels just, they're usable for other things but on the side of the bottle, they're not so useful. So usually what I do is I crush the bottle in my hand and I cut the bottom off. Carefully enough that I can reuse the bottle to the bottom. This bottle's still wet inside, so I'm actually not going to use it for the exercise because it's a little annoying. But this kind of lightweight plastic is great because if you want to make everything all curly, you can take your blow dryer or even heat it in the sun and really do all kinds of crazy things. I usually, if I am heating up plastic, even with a blow dryer, I wear a mask because you don't want to breathe it. Um, you know, thank you, COVID, for making people a little more mask conscious. Mm. So look, she did it. She's got one. She's ready. So. I sometimes like to plan my jellyfish. What I do with this part of the bottle, I like to use the neck side, but you can use the bottom side. It doesn't matter. Turn yours upside down. Let me see the other half of your bottle there. Okay, great. You're awesome. And you don't need necessarily need the lid. Sometimes I cut my tentacles freestyle to up here. Um, but if I want to plan my tentacles, I will take a piece of paper, roll it up and stick it in there just to have an idea. Okay, so this piece of paper fits. So I'm gonna draw a mess of tentacles on it and then roll it inside and I have a form to follow. So you can do it either way. I'll show you what I'm talking about. My younger students, pardon the scraping noise as I move my computer, don't always like freestyle cutting. They get nervous that they're gonna do something wrong. And there is no wrong, but I taught them this technique so that they could feel totally confident about making their tentacles happen. Otherwise they just cut them straight as a fringe, but here's some quickie tentacles. So you can do it either way. Some of my students will actually just draw on the bottle, but it's more fun to reserve the Sharpies for coloring your bottle. So I'll just show you, but you guys can just freestyle cut because 
you're artists, you have visual minds. Um, the key is not to cut all the way up. You know, leave, stop your cutting about here. So, and it helps to have a good sharp set of scissors. I'm gonna use my massive shears here. These guys are spring loaded. They're pretty awesome. And you just, you know, you're gonna to have to cut some negative space, but you don't necessarily have to. This paper's annoying, so I'm just gonna freestyle cut. Let's cut a spiral all the way up the bottom. But that means you only have one tentacle. That can be a little disappointing if you want to have a massive number. And I don't throw these pieces away. I hole punch them and I can attach them to the jellyfish later. So my idea is to try and use 100% of your object as one way to remove plastic waste from the world is to use it instead of throwing away the snippets. Now, in some cases, I can't get away from waste occurring. And that's the sad truth about plastic is when you start making things, you make waste as a byproduct. But um, it saddens me. There seems to be no way around it. Well, if everybody had, well, not everybody, maybe it's like community-based shredder machines, right? So it's like you can collect the bits that get left out and then yeah. Yeah. use them, you know? I was watching, there's this great YouTuber. There are these brothers. They have their own precious plastic facility in their home and they have this massive warehouse they've built out. And a comment that I, you know, made, I was like, well, what happens to all these other plastics? And he said, well, we just, you know, we melt it down and we, we use it. We actually have a shredder at uh, Precious Plastics and we have it in a remote location being run off a solar panel. Mm -hmm. uh, but some small pieces like this, the shredder doesn't like, it jams it. So there's sort of a, a an ideal size for what goes through our shredder. Ours is a baby shredder. It's like a paper shredder. We're hoping one day to get a more, you know, industrial grade shredder that could take whole objects. And so we would have very little waste in that situation because right now we're hand cutting all our plastics down, which is one reason why I can cut plastic super fast. I do this every Friday. We go and we help hold the equivalent of a quilting party, cutting up plastic which is how we generate a lot of our ideas on how to take action. It's like five or six of us really dedicated folks who've been doing this a long time, a long time, two years. And we finally graduated to a warehouse from a goat shed because I, I love the goats. They're cute and fun, but they like to eat plastic, which is not good for them. So cutting plastic in the vicinity of a goat is a frustrating have to watch that creature behind you who's gonna reach over and run away with it. We don't tell the Board of Health about the goat shed. I think they would have shut us down if they'd known. But it is, you know, it's part of our history and part of our process that we started in a goat shed. This is really fun. Thank you guys. Oh, it was really cute. But it was also extremely cold and wet because it was up in the town of Volcano, which is notoriously cold and wet. And you go, cold in Hawaii, what's the big deal? Well, when you're at about 60 degrees and it has been raining for five days straight wow. and you are in a goat shed with a lot of wind, it's cold and wet. And even the goats are unhappy. <laughs> the big problem was the plastic would grow mold almost as quickly as we cleaned it. It wasn't a good environment for storing. Okay, so I cut my jellyfish in half accident. I like, okay. I like, I, like, I did this, Susan. Oh, oh, that's a wonderful accident. Do you have a hole punch? No. But I you, could, you could hole punch it and sew it together. 
or you can just make half jellyfishes. Why not? Um, so here, here's my jellyfish beginning. Um, and the thing that I discovered is you can start to reform this plastic with your hand. So if you don't want it to all crumple inward, you can reform the plastic with the heat of your hand or the heat of a blow dryer or the heat of the sun. It's a little cool in my room for that. So I'm not gonna worry about that part. I'm gonna move on to part two. So most jellyfish have this beautiful canopy. Yeah. And that's what the bottom of your bottle can be. And hooking them together is the key. In my case, I can cheat. I have hole punches. But those of you who don't have hole punches, you can use your scissors to cut into the center of the bottom and basically create a slot for your hanger. The bottom, very center part, is so rigid and so hard that you're not going to be able to cut through it. And so then you can use a cord. Look at this. I have some old uh, fairy lights that I found in the rubbish. I love things like fairy lights because generally they're clean when they get thrown in the rubbish. And they have these great stoppers on them called the former lights, which gives you a great way to keep things you know, sewed together. And in this case, I'm going to probably put some other object on the end of this to keep it from going through the bottle. So I'm jammed, but you can use any piece of cordage and Hannah knows how to make cordage. So see how I've done this. I'm just gonna put something here on the bottom so it can't come back out the bottle. What have I got lying around in my bag of tricks? Well, I could do that, That's sort of ugly looking. This is where you start looking around for things that you can, ah, here we go an inside piece. Again, I'll do the same trick. I'm pretending I don't have a hole punch for your benefit. Thank you. So see how I slid it. And now I'm gonna use that stopper. I'm gonna bring it all the way to the center of the slit. So this is now going to go on the inside. Now you can see how we're getting a complicated jellyfish out of just a few little objects they often have an inside skirt and now you remember those two slits that I had you make I'm going to tie it off like this and then run it down the channel and the nice part about plastic horrible as it is, is it really likes to hold onto itself. Mm. So um, once you get it all assembled, if you want, you can use a glue gun to really stabilize it, or you can just tie everything off. And in this case, I'm going to just tie a knot. See how I've pulled it down. Everything's pretty tight. We already have the beginnings of a a jellyfish going right here. So just because you don't have a hole punch does not mean that you cannot make this happen. A hole punch or an awl is a bomb because it really allows you. So this is the beginning of the base of your jellyfish. Mm -hmm. okay. um, what I usually do, and this is where the hole punch is golden, and I have several, um, is I tend to hole punch outside of that bell. It helps to pay attention to your hole punch and do it the right way, not the wrong way. Because this way I can tie on all kinds of tendrils. And this is the part that especially little kids adore is being able to control where they put stuff. Um, but you can use a hot needle. Um, you know, there's all kinds of sharp objects. It's just you have to be careful. I do not teach the K through five to use a hot needle. You can imagine what would happen. Yeah. And it has happened. <laughs> and 
and I keep using the wrong side of the hole punch. It's frustrating. So once you've done that, you can begin adding. I have all kinds of things lying around. This is a beautiful silver coffee bag. I can make streamers and tie them on. I can start fringing these guys because fringing can be really cool. Um, and one of my other favorite things is the plastic straw mm -hmm. because you can use the plastic straw to create mini jellyfish because you can slice up the plastic straw and make a bunch of little feet. Matter of fact, I make little mini squid this way and embed them inside. You had a cap, Renee. And uh -huh. a little glue and a cap and a couple straws done like this. Yeah. And you can have the cutest little baby jellyfish going. Um, I also make a whale out of a paper plate and this is the spout. So one of the secrets about the straws that I really love is you can run your fingernail along the slices and they start to curl. Oh yeah, also you can use like the thing of the scissors, right? And you can like do that like how a ribbon would. Yeah, you can do the same thing. Sometimes scissors will slice, but you know, you give it a little, my scissors, which are serrated are not so good for this but these this pair which is a little duller little kids dull scissors work great mm. there we go it's starting to so i call these little squidlets but the other thing is you can do this and then you can embed it inside the jellyfish so that's what i was going to do with this straw i also sometimes make legs and arms and things with straws by you know poking a hole through them mm. and making a joint with a skewer a bamboo skewer so you can trim it off however you want mm -hmm. so you can see that i mean uh, the big thing about jellyfish is they do a lot of this attractive ornamental stuff to attract prey so it is all about the snacks so the wilder you make it So I could attach here, or I could make these individual strips and just tie them on. So there's a lot of different venues for a straw. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, they're, they're one of my happens here. I have an extra leg that doesn't belong to There, now my jellyfish has a little more breathing room to it. So oh, what I'm actually going to do is slice this all the way up and uh, tie it on and see. This is the other thing is you can open it up as much as you want. I'm going to rip. No, nope, ripping does not work with plastic. It works with paper. So here's a piece and I could literally tie it off and never need anything else. And I could tie it off in the middle, slice it some more. And all of this can be done with tying off. Here we've got, now I can fringe it some more. If I, if I could actually fringe instead of cutting. It gets exciting after a while you start playing around and messing around and discover that there's so many different ways you can work with the material. That's not fair. I'm not showing you what I'm doing. So, and if you don't like it, the nice part about tying is you can just take it apart and go, well, that sucked. I didn't like that. So nothing ever sucks because the thing about nature is nature doesn't suck and you're trying your best to make something look natural. So another way is to jam. That one's not going to work. So one of the other things I also do, I'm not going to, I'm going to untie this just because it's in the way of what else I'm doing. I 
I'm sort of thinking that this was another thing that I saved. Yeah. Add some beautiful blue parts. This will make perfect tendrils. And again, easy to tie on. So it's really just a matter of slicing these lovely long slices and adding them to the outside. The only problem with packaging like this is you have to wash it carefully. Because if you don't wash it, Mr. Cockroach and Mr. Rat are going to join you in bed or wherever you have this lovely object. And it's not gonna smell terribly good after a while either. So I've learned that I really don't enjoy Mr. Rat and Mr. Cockroach. When I started collecting plastics down in Lower Puna where Hannah first saw my plates, I ended up with a dreadful rat and cockroach problem until I realized that I could not harbor unclean plastic at my farm. And I started protecting it pretty carefully. But originally I was taking dirty plastic from the transition. Uh, so here I am with some lovely holes and I can stick this in and the nice part about film like this is you can crush it, twist it and put it through just about any hole. In this case, I'm gonna do a slightly different tie off. I'm going to just make a loop and pull it through and try not to cut it. But it takes some adjusting to working with it because the plastic will, it didn't like to work that way. It told me it does not like to be looped like that. It wants to be tied in a simple knot. Each plastic will tell you by resistance what it wants you to do with it. So the toughest part is listening to what it tells you. Mm. My theory is the reason plastic tells you is it's really from dinosaurs and plants originally. And those living creatures are still informing how it wants to be. So you have to listen to those ancient voices. I know some people say that's really woo woo, but you know, if it's a film like this, it's going to want to curl. Now I could use my scissors to make it curl, but I think right now my fingers are a little gentler than the scissors and my lay making thumbnail, which is super hard. This is the mark of a lay maker. They have one long fingernail somewhere that's super hard, like a knife. And you use that oh, to cut the flowers off your tree. And I always had this problematic thumbnail my whole life. Like I can barely cut it. When it gets really long, it's in the way. And then my laymaking kumu looked at me and said, you have a laymaking thumbnail. You're made to do this. And this is, you know, you should let it grow long as long as you can tolerate. And you'll always be able to pick flowers to make lace. So who knew that was a thing? His is a pinky nail. So. So if you were given the gift of one hard, long nail, that's why. So there we are. Here are some beautiful tendrils all ready to go. And they're already multicolored. And you just keep working until you've got a complete fringe around the jellyfish. Oh, and my, my stopper did not work. That says, I'll go to my second favorite stopper, which is usually a large washer or something similar. So pardon me while I look for the object of my dreams. Yeah. And I'm gonna show you guys, this is this is a minimalist version of a jellyfish. Good job. Ah, oh my goodness. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I just have to figure this out. It's a little harder when I've already made it, but I'm sure I've got something lying around in the studio that will do the job. Oh, Renee, where's yours? Let's see yours. <laughs> I love that we're doing this. Oh, this, this is is mine, mine looks awful. <laughs> no, it's cute. I love it. First time is always the trickiest. 
I tell you that from experience, the prototypes look gross. And then you figure out how to make it work. Um, so the, the fact that your first one looks terrible is actually a real sign of good growth. But you guys, we're yeah. you grown as women playing with plastic on a Wednesday afternoon. You know what I'm saying? I got scissors cutting the patriarchy away right now. You know what I'm saying? Ah, that's what is adorable yeah. about what we're doing right now. Seriously, I feel like this is literally like, you know, Erica, I don't know oh, what's so Renee. Have you met Erica before? Erica was oh. no. All right. So she's one of the regulars at the iPhone women meetings and she asked me at the beginning of this yeah i was going to work with her she's a joy strategist so she helps Ooh. busy moms and, and and women find joy in 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 what they're doing and so one of the exercises she had me do was to you know, really dream about like what what have you accomplished at the end of this year and my dream was like you know i this is one building that i have in mind in new york city i've been eyeing i've been I've like when I saw it, I was like, this, like, this is the building. It's has all these different rooms and different levels. And it's a like, great, like high ceiling entrance. And I was like, this is the healing hub. Like, like this is a titty center, you know, like, 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 like this is the thing. And, and one of the activities at, like in this place would be us doing something like this on a random afternoon, instead of being wherever the heck the matrix wants us to be at, you know? And so I think in many ways, you know, we're not ideal. We're not in an office. We're in different locations. I mean, my fucking, I'm leaving my fucking house right now. You know what I mean? But like, this is fucking doing it, bros. <laughs> well, I found a stopper to make it work, and it's just one of these bulldog clips. Bulldog. I happened to find like a bunch of them scattered at the beach, and I harvested them. Yeah. But the cool thing about this is not only does it clip. It's got some things to attach stuff to. So it can become more, I can make a center core in here and attach things in here. So that's the nice thing about things like this. And I'll show you the, the, uh, the grand plan when I'm done is there'll be a dome on top of the dome and this is going to take some jiggering. I'll probably spend a week or so working on this idea. So it's not something we do right away. But see this? Yeah. This is one of those little solar lights that people jam in their yard. And it's a single LED and it rips apart. Matter of fact, I ripped the ring apart. That's awesome. This is the main core of it. This is the light bulb. So it's going to go under here and this clear part will not interfere with its ability to see light. And so it will, it's not going to turn on now because it's not fully charged, but I can have a fully lit jellyfish and the jellyfish will glow in the nighttime because this will only turn on at night. So imagine a whole bunch of these jellyfish hanging in a tree somewhere, just yeah. lighting up at night and then slowly fading into darkness four or five hours later. It should be really fun. Or even like using Renee's idea of like electrifying stuff, right? Like if they were to attach like mini solar panels to trap the sunlight energy and then that can generate the light as well and make it glow in the trees. Right. Like so, the development brain is thinking about like safety because we had to do this study one time about how many street lamps there were on a street in Worcester mm -hmm. and depending on how many street lamps there were depend like it said that the fewer the street lamps the more dangerous it, it is and this could also be like tying it tying this idea into like a community development initiative for artists to 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 light up certain you know areas that don't have as much lighting as a public safety art in general though you know like yeah everywhere well, uh, I'll sh we'll move on to lights. I'm going to go get the light I just developed, which is fun. Okay. And recycles plastic. I'll be right back. Okay. Renee. <laughs> I know. What's Ben's name? Um, surname? Let me find him on LinkedIn. Yo, yes. Thank you for reminding me about that. Von Wong. Here, you know what? I'm going to do this right now. Oh, my God. With a V? V, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I don't know how well you'll be able to see the color mm -hmm. because it's white. Let's try multicolor. It's so bright in this room. I'm going to walk you into the closet. I'll make it really dark and we'll see. Oh yeah, it's showing. I'll put it on the floor. You'll get to look at the floor of my closet. See that? Yes. Cool, that's wild. So that's an outdoor LED. Wow. <laughs> Color changing one. And at night, it's really um, quite spectacular. In the day, it's really hard, as you can tell, because it's hard to see what's going on. But this is just a tide free bottle with its labels ripped off. Yeah. And here is the LED light. So it's just, it's on top. Eventually, I'm going to hollow out the bottle and actually put it in the bottle and make it waterproof with its lid. And again, I can fill that with some sand or rocks at the bottom and place those out in the environment. And they can be fun little lighting things. So I also plan to decorate them with uh, black tape so that they have designs, fish on them. Uh, they'll look like the fish that are, let's see, there. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, those buckets. Yeah, those are the buckets. Wow. The buckets are going to be lit too. That's going to be an eight foot tower when I get around to making it. It takes a lot of time to do those tape designs though. Many, many hours of work. So that, that's a project for down the line when I have nothing else to do for a few days. I remember, I remember when you were working on that. Yeah. But these guys, you know, I can probably whip off a five or six of them pretty quickly over a few days with the same kind of design. And of course, these are kappa cloth designs. They're, they're a traditional Hawaiian geometric design, uh, very allied to tattooing designs. Well, done the same way on a piece of bamboo. I just replicate that using tape. It's the same ge geometry that's involved. Yeah. So yeah, that's far afield from a jellyfish, but the jellyfish, I really want them to be lit because some jellyfish phosphoresce on their own. So it makes it more exciting that way. <laughs> great, great curriculum idea. Sweet, thanks Susan for sharing that. You're welcome. Yeah, we have about three more minutes left. Mm, I guess something I would like to, I don't know, maybe share with, with you guys. Mm, the presentation on the 25th of August. Mm -hmm. You guys can hear me. I, my video might be frozen. I can hear you. You're frozen, but you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, now you're not talking. <laughs> oh. I'm the host now, apparently. We'll see if she yeah. wants. Yeah, I think she probably just trying to get back on. Yeah, yeah. I know we all deal with that. Okay, we see you again wild that was wild so i'm just looking at the 25th right now and right now that's a thursday right yeah let me look my calendar out as well we're having a meeting at 3 p.m um yeah man with as many people as we can get in the space to communicate the plan to as many people as possible. So 3 p.m. New what? York time or Tennessee time? New York time, EST. Okay, EDT. Yeah. 
So that would be nine o'clock my time. Thanks, Susan. Right now, I'm just I will bring it into my Google Calendar now, just to so that I have the correct time. Yep. yep so when yep. you say um, prepare the plan, or you're talking about revealing up um, the plan. Reve yeah, re revealing, <laughs> revealing the blueprint. Yeah, a little bit of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, excited. Can't wait. Yeah. Okay, I just put in meeting with Hannah, nine to ten a.m. Hawaii time. Hmm. So that is that for a part of this, um, or is that for something else? A part of what, Renee? So um, for this uh, um, workshop, you know, we have different, um, you know, sessions and everything. Is this a part of this workshop or something separate? Both. It's part of this workshop. This workshop was gearing up really to the meeting on the 25th. Ideally, people would join in and they would share their ideas and their experiences, you know, off of the kind of world they want to see and the world that they want to be part of. And then we put that information into the blueprint for the presentation. And then we have our final class on the 26th. Okay, and then September 5th, yeah, I have to like sort of like, you know, breathe and, you know, adjust and stuff like that. But it's really moving into the Plastic Museum classes that I'll be holding over the month of September. And that's going to be it. three times a week. Yeah, three times a week, probably at the same time for the, I'll do maybe like an hour class because three times a week is pretty intense for, for people to, to make time for. So just like, like an hour class and then we'll we'll keep moving forward. My my goal at the end of the year is to really have the council members really like understand what it is we're doing. And I, they don't need to be you know necessarily like, yeah, like super like gung-ho about it, but they need to at least be a little bit more aware of the intensity of the situation. In, in a, you know, in a way that isn't like, you guys need to change this and you guys need to do that, but in like a more loving, like, listen, like we're doing it like with or without you, you know, and like that's giving you a heads up on like what we're, you guys, I had this crazy download. There was this like family that was broken into in Tennessee and they kept like, getting broken into. And I was like, I really feel right. Like the level of crime and that I think don't, 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 don't listen to it. Like don't listen to all of it that. Okay. Like sometimes I'm a bit like, I look up, but really like this was like literally when I read that news article, it was like the download was like, these like activists are like breaking into homes of people who, <laughs> who like still eat meat and I was like that is fucking crazy that was the download I don't know how that came through but so like maybe like draw that connection in yeah I know they're not happy with me it's okay autism awareness yeah. that's a sign <laughs> but I agree yeah. I, I think education you know from a point of or the perspective of you know educating people it's not about saying hey I'm right you're wrong but just educating others, you know, making them more aware. Yeah, it's more an enticement process than a chastisement process. Yes, exactly. Oh, Can you hear you? Oh, oh you're mute. <laughs> unmute yourself. <laughs> there you go. You're unmuted. You should be okay. Okay, hi. Sorry, there was a van that came by that said autism awareness. And I was like, oh, okay. What did I miss, you guys? I'm sorry, that happened. <laughs> no. We were talking about enticing rather than chastising people. Yeah, yeah. like educating, um, just doing it through education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, Renee, I'm literally going to send this email as soon as we get off this phone All call. Right. Then. Absolutely. All right, sounds good okie dokie ladies all right thank you thank you thank you susan thank you renee for joining us today Welcome. my pleasure and your pleasure no doubt it's yes same here <laughs> nice to meet you ladies <laughs> all right nice to see you again hannah <laughs> all right see you guys next time okay all right bye bye